so nice to have you here. I'm home. <laughs> you are. You are. And I want to talk a little bit about that. That's something that um, I think people know that you have Kentucky roots, but I want to know a little bit more about that. But I I'm also curious, you are so many things. Uh, you, you, uh, we're all sort of defined by our labels uh, mm. at times. Uh, mother and grandmother and activist and singer and performer and it goes on and on and on. When you think of your yourself, um, what do you think of first about who you are? What a great question. I can tell a lot about an interviewer by the questions they ask. <laughs> Very, well, you, because you've done that yourself. <laughs> you're very well informed. Yeah. Interesting question. Um, it's always sort of curious to me if I'm standing in the wings of uh, uh, a theater, if I'm getting ready to go out and give a lecture, um, or if I'm just being introduced at some event, what they choose to stereotype, what mm. labels they want to put on me and I've always loved um, the moniker the star next door mm. I'll never forget the first time someone introduced me that way mm. and I was supposed to bolt onto the stage then as soon as they introduced me and it took me just a second because that felt so um, I appreciated that mm -hmm. because I know there's nothing different about me um, it's just that I do some unusual <laughs> things in my career. But um, to say the star next door sort of connotes that I am every woman. And I really appreciate that because of the encyclopedic range of things I've done in my life. Mm -hmm. Well, tell me about your um, your Kentucky connection and um how much Kentucky is is in the star next door. Um, I know some of that, but y you tell me that story. Born and raised. Um, my mom has a house I was born and raised in, essentially, in Ashland, Kentucky. So um, the roots are very deep. Hmm. I know the ancestral lineage going back to um, um, my great, great, grandfather mm. who was uh he used his pension from the civil war mm. to buy the jet home place in louisa mm. kentucky mm. uh ricky skaggs is from cordell mm -hmm. which is close to us mm -hmm. so we claim um ancestors mm -hmm. we're country cousins as we mm -hmm. as we like to say mm -hmm. um so the roots are very deep and i've hopefully imparted that to Winona and Ashley. Yeah. Do you uh, do you get back there often? I, I know you worked there and we're going to talk a little bit about that, but do you do you go back and visit? Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I was just home to see Mom, uh, I guess, last month. Uh-huh. How's she doing? She is uh, in a nursing home. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's sad, isn't it? It is. Yeah. But she must be mighty proud of you. Well, you have to ask her that. <laughs> <laughs> so you, our family um, isn't much aren't much for uh, showing emotions. Ah, uh, is that a good thing? No, no, <laughs> it's not. And I think in life, uh, if we sort of become a detective, if we step back and are objective, and sort of revisit, we can tell um, how we've sort of recreated in our own lives what we didn't get as children and I know I was talking to Dolly um, Dolly's one of my favorite people on the planet I'm very proud to call her a girlfriend uh, Dolly and Reba and I were talking one time Reba McIntyre and this is years ago and it became evident to us that um, Dolly and I are the same age Reba's I think eight years younger but um, we grew up in a generation, Reba came from rodeo people, and you probably know all about Dolly coming from Seaverville, Tennessee. Um, no one in our family was allowed to show emotion. Mm -hmm. It was just real bare bones, you know, just work hard. And um, there was nothing, 
there was no art form in the house. So because we were sort of squelched, I always felt like a big pinata walking around wishing somebody would hmm. break me open so I could spell out my secrets. Um, Reba and Dolly and I have, as adults, been doing what we wanted to do as children, mm. which is to express ourselves, to write songs, to uh, to be animated, to be entertainers. A, a lot of that, I think, comes from our the male side of the family, don't you think? Uh, Absolutely. Fathers and and dads, uh, maybe that went through the war um, and, and just refused to talk about it. I mean, we still, uh, especially among our World War II veterans, mm. uh, those of uh, who are still uh, remaining? There, there are very few. Um, maybe toward the end of their life, they they begin to open up a little bit more. But but you're all for laying it on the table and and talking about it and being expressive and mm -hmm. and, and talking about one's one's life. Um, uh, Dolly's made a a career out of it, and uh, gosh, it's been about 20 years ago. But I was over at Reba's house having supper, and coincidentally. She had a song on the radio that was a number one hit that week uh, called The Greatest Man I Never Knew. Lived just down the hall, and she's referring to her dad, mm. um, Clarky. Uh, his name was Clark. Uh, again, rodeo family out of Stringtown, Oklahoma. But um, she began talking about the fact that he had never really told her he loved her. Mm. And that's that generation um, that mm -hmm. you're referring mm -hmm. to. And that week, he had to go in for open-heart surgery. Um, and as they were wheeling him literally into surgery, he looked up at her from his gurney and said, uh, Reba, I love you. And as she was telling this to me, you know, the, the tears just came. And it's a generational thing, but I really think that shows like Oprah and... Um, all the the self-help books and all that. So what you've done encouraged. too, don't you think? I mean, uh, you, you've um, sort of promoted that on your in in your career on your radio program. I mean, mm -hmm. wasn't that sort of uh, uh, you zeroed in on on what people were thinking and and, and needed to express and couldn't express uh, that that mm -hmm. sort of thing? And you talk about that a lot in your in your uh, what what do you your motivational speaking, which sounds sort of like um, that's sort of the formal title, um, but you're sort of performing at the same time. I mean, although there's, I, I don't, I don't know if you sing. You sing. You, you might hum a few bars, um, or there might be a video that that shows something. What What do you call what you do now? And hmm. when you meet people and in, in, in an audience, and are, are you trying to get them to sort of give you some feedback? They're here to. They're in the audience to see and hear you, and you, you, I, I see you sort of trying to pull out of them some, some emotion. Sure. It's, uh, you know, it's like going to the zoo. You, <laughs> who's watching who? And if you know anything about me, you know that I'm absolutely audience participation. Um, it's actually, my actress thought it calls it the pinch and the ouch. Um, the ouch. Yeah, as an actress, she knows her lines, but she doesn't do anything until her um, her uh, cohort gives her the pinch, so that she can um, respond appropriately. Mm -hmm. And when I'm with people that. Um, for instance, today I'm going to be talking about some stuff that's probably going to make me cry. Some real autobiographical stuff, some chronological stuff that... Um, um, some new material? Why haven't you talked uh, about it before? It hasn't been the right venue. This mm -hmm. is a very... This is an extraordinary uh, situation. The One Parent Scholar mm -hmm. House... Um, Wow, if I had known that there was an organization like this, it would have changed the trajectory of my life if, if, if it had existed uh, back when I was in need because um, I survived domestic violence. Uh, well, it's tough.
tough still. Mm. I'm glad that uh, we made a connection because I didn't know, even though it's right here, uh, where you were speaking until we contacted your people and, mm. and began to learn about the, um, uh, you're speaking at the Luncheon Education Bills Hope, uh, the One Parent Scholar House. So that's something that uh, Kentucky Educational Television would be interested in, in profiling and, and having them oh. as a guest on this program and, and talking Absolutely. about what they do. I've mentioned it to a couple of people and they didn't know. So I, I'm, I'm glad that you're you're sharing uh, today uh, with them. Um, Winona and Ashley were, were born and raised in Ashland? Winona was born in the same room, same hospital, King's Daughters Hospital in Ashland, Kentucky, attended by the same nurse <laughs> that my mom had me when she was 18. So, um, but Ashley was born in That's California. Amazing. Yeah, okay. Um, I married Ashley's dad, and he uh, had just graduated from Transylvania, so we got sent to uh, to California. Of course, I'd never been out of Ashland, Kentucky, so that was a whole new. So your Kentucky world. roots uh, are really—I mean, they run—they run deep. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I know you're proud of that. Oh, absolutely. Uh, y you do uh, a lot of other things. Uh, well. Uh, the organizations that you're affiliated with are uh, a, a long, long list, but a couple of those that are Kentucky-related, uh, including the one that you're speaking uh, to today and, and others. But um, I noticed uh, one is, um, it's the July 4th um, Judd's uh, Family Food Drive, is that correct, uh, if for Appalachia? Is that still? It's River City's Harvest. Uh -huh. It's usually around July the 4th. and. Uh, um the Appalachian Food Pantry is just <clears throat> always desperate, mm -hmm. so we try to send in an 18-wheeler. Um, sometimes I work with Feed the Children, Larry Jones out of Oklahoma, to uh, try to keep uh, some stuff on the shelves of the Appalachian Food Pantry. You've also uh, been involved uh, really as an activist uh, with uh, Mountaintop Removal. Mm -hmm. and uh, an organization there, I, and I think you, uh, did, did, did you become yourself interested in that, or did Ashley sort of uh, learn about that and, and educate the rest of the family and get you involved in that? I think Ashley and I came to it about the same time. When you're from eastern Kentucky and you see firsthand uh, how they're raping the land and pillaging the the mountaintops, um, you can't not get involved. Uh, so there is a, uh, even though you're this lovely person and uh, performer and, and star um, and so successful, you sort of have this, uh, this political uh, thing in your, in your gut too that you, you feel very passionately about. Uh, and, and this is just one of the examples. I mean, feeding the poor uh, mm -hmm. Poverty uh, in Kentucky, especially mm -hmm. uh, mountaintop removal. Uh, there are other areas too. So, so you don't you don't shy away from the controversial, do you? No, justice, um, justice for all. <laughs> d does it d d is it um, is it is that part of of the world today? Sort of. Um, distasteful to you or that's not the right word is it is it sort of uncomfortable to you to get politically involved in something i know you had some some feelings about um, ashley getting involved in the in the senate race here uh, and and did you breathe a sigh of relief when she decided not to i did but that was uh because um i'm her mother and i well first of all we went to um Washington. Ashley and our family psychologist, Ted Klontz, we went up there um, numerous times to sort of check out the lay of the land. And um, Ashley and I shared a, a suite so that we could, in the center, have the living room area where we would have our meetings and all. So at the end of the day, <coughs> um, Ashley and I were, 
I, I can't find a strong enough word. We were so horrified at the sociopathy, what we saw going on in Washington, D.C. Um, you have to understand that Ashley has such a pure heart. Ashley's like me. Um, I think coming from Kentucky, you have a sensibility about what certain needs are because Kentucky is a, a state that needs so many different um, justice programs. But Ashley comes into everything with a certain amount of naivete because she's brilliant. You know, she has a degree from Harvard. She went back to Harvard a couple of years ago. Uh, I'll never forget, we were having supper at the, <clears throat> the supper table one night, and it's sort of become um, a legend in, in Judd lore now. Uh, <laughs> it started years ago when I thought she was going to go to um, the Peace Corps, mm -hmm. straight from graduating the University of Kentucky. She'd been accepted in the Peace Corps, and she said, Mama, pass the salt. I think I'll go to Hollywood and become an actress. <clears throat> and um, lo and behold, she did, and uh, what an actress she is. So all these years later, she still does that to me. Like a couple of years ago, she said, Mama, pass the salt. I think I'll go back to Harvard and get a deg degree in global economics. Uh, but, but, but. <laughs> yeah. So when at the supper table she said, Mama, pass the salt, I think I'll go to Washington. Why don't you come with me and let's check out the landscape, mm -hmm. see if uh, Mitch McConnell is still viable and uh, see what we can do to unseat him. So I never know what she's going to do, but <laughs> I know that it's prompted by um, such a pure heart. And she knows her stuff. Did you, um, did you and Ashley find in Washington um, what uh, most of us outside of the Beltway and outside uh, in, in the heartland uh, in Kentucky ha have now discovered, um, uh, which is just almost an impossible place to be in gridlock, uh, uh, millennials, the young uh, poll just, just out of Harvard. Uh, by our our own Kentuckian uh, Trey Grayson, who yeah. is in the uh, uh, Harvard uh, office of uh, politics, there, you know, Trey's leaving, coming back to Kentucky to live. Did did you know that mm -hmm. he's he's giving up his Harvard job? But anyway, his study found that these young people, eighteen to thirty four, eighteen to twenty nine, are, are completely um, uh, they've lost faith in the system. Uh, they don't think Washington works. Um, did, did you find that just in the time that you were there, sort of trying to make a decision on what to do? Yeah. Was it exasperating, exhausting for it you? It was beyond uh, exasperating. Let me find a stronger word. Um, you used the word horrified. I mm. think that comes closer because mm. <clears throat> these are elected <clears throat> officials, and they are supposed to be our representatives. And <clears throat> one of the things that's happened in this country is the bipartisanship. <clears throat> you know, you're a Republican or you're a Democrat. I personally am a registered independent. I vote on the issues. Um, what a concept, huh? Mm. I thought that that's what the two-party system was supposed to be for, you know, whoever came up with the best idea. Um, but <clears throat> at the end of the day, Ashley and I were so, <clears throat> I guess the word is mortified, mm. um, devastated, by the lack of um, also the lack of sincerity, mm. the lack of awareness, the lack of uh, uh, a willingness to listen to the other side. Um, we were just, I mean, sometimes we cry mm. to tell you the truth. Well, let's leave all that stuff aside. There, there are more important things to talk about. Um, Let me just say that I was thrilled. I was relieved that uh, she chose, and it was her, obviously it was her call. Um, all I would do would be just to be her biggest cheerleader and be there to, to be her, um, help her psychologically and uh, point out things. But at the end of the day, 
it was her call and she made a good call. Well, let's talk about you. Uh, this medically documented miracle is, mm. um, it is really quite fascinating to me and I'm sure a lot of other people. Um, you contracted hepatitis C, mm -hmm. uh, fatal uh, for a lot of people, uh, mm -hmm. but not you. Ha ha in the in the dark of night or the early morning dawn, do you think about that and and, and what really happened to you and, and why you survived, why you are a survivor? I think about it every minute. Ah, I do. Um, I before the singing career, I was a registered nurse, and I worked in ICU. Um, and if you know anything about ICU and it's basically a trauma situation. It's, it's like the ER. You subjugate yourself. You get needle sticks. You have bodily fluids. So um, the best guess is that um, I got a contaminated needle stick in the um, early 80s when I was working as an RN. And it's a retrograde virus, so it didn't actually fulminate it didn't manifest uh, with symptomology until I was into my singing career fast forward 10 years so here I am finally finally figured something out um, it, you know life is not fair mm. nobody said it was going to be but here I am at the top of my game um, I finally have friends I have something I can do Winona and I have found a way to communicate. Um, I've been able to buy Ashley a house that has a thermostat. Mm. Um, all she ever wanted was just to have a normal childhood, bless her heart. So all of a sudden, mm -hmm. which has been one of the uh, uh, hallmarks of my life, you know, just about the time I start to figure something out, it explodes into chaos. Mm. So, yep, the Mayo Clinic tells me I have three years to live, and um, uh, hepatitis C is called a silent killer. It will actually, in the next decade, kill four times more Americans than AIDS will. I mm. mean, you're a journalist. Did you know that? Yeah. No, I, don't, I didn't know that number. In the next decade, yeah. hepatitis C... The next decade. Yeah. will kill four times more Americans than AIDS will, mm -hmm. and nobody knows about it. Mm -hmm. So but, that's one um, of your, uh, that's one of the things you try to do is talk about it and, and make people, like journalists, more aware of it. Um, well, this has gone much too quickly. We only have a few minutes left, and uh, I, I want to touch on um, a couple of more things. One, I, and this might have helped you sort of deal with this this medical emergency that you had and, and the surviving that and in this uh, it's sort of your your unfailing optimism and and spirit and and hope uh, about yourself and in others was that instilled in you uh, early on how did, was that how did all that occur <laughs> I mean, I, you just don't wake up one day I, and say I, pass the salt I'm gonna be an, an, an optimist do you <laughs> I have asked myself that um, countless times because I can't point to anyone in our family oh. that, um, in fact, um, there's a there's a real pathology. There's a real um, pessimism in our family. Um, depression, and I battle depression. Ashley battles depression. We've been pretty vocal about that. Mm -hmm. Um, but let me jump forward here and say that uh, one of my dear friends, um, and I'm very proud to call him a friend, his name is Dr. Francis Collins. Mm. He decoded the genome. Mm. He's that guy. He decoded mm -hmm. the human genome mm -hmm. in the year 2000. He was on the cover of Time magazine and um, <clears throat> one of the most brilliant scientists <clears throat> that ever lived. And now he's actually uh, the um, head of the NIH. He's that guy. Oh, okay. But he came, he's been a friend for 23 years. He has taught me that, <clears throat> and he's the expert in genes, so he would know that really only a third of our genetic makeup is responsible for um, all this stuff, that we actually get only a third 
of our genes are responsible. Two thirds of it is up to us hmm. to decide how those genes are expressed. He came to visit me. In fact, it's the first vacation he's ever had. Hmm. Um, a couple of months ago, he came to the farm to stay for a week. Oh, so nice. of course I pestered him about all this, but yeah. um, he's taught me that um, we're really in such a seat of power. And he's helped me with my depression. And of course, I share this with Ashley mm-hmm. um, in battling depression, which is an illness. You know, it's not a, a mental um, depression is just like diabetes or thyroid or whatever. Your brain doesn't make enough of the good feel good chemicals. So you, just like with diabetes, you have to if your body doesn't, your pancreas doesn't produce insulin, you have to take insulin. Um, if your thyroid isn't active, you have to take thyroxin. So if your brain doesn't make the good feel-good chemicals to give you a level playing field, then you need to take antidepressants. Antidepressants, SSRIs, or MEOI uh, inhibitors. But um, it's not a character flaw, is what I'm trying to yeah, say. Yeah, yeah. Depression is not a character flaw. It's a, it's a very real disease, just like heart disease. In fact, one out of four Americans every year will have a, a mental illness. Well, you've uh, been absolutely delightful. Uh, again, we appreciate uh, the time that you're taking away from the reason uh, that you came to uh, Lexington uh, to celebrate the uh, Education Bill's Hope Luncheon, uh, the One Parent Scholar House. Uh, we hope you'll come back. Just drop in some day. We'll have a supper. I, I love that you said <laughs> supper time a minute ago. Uh, that's what I had when I grew up, supper time. So, uh, Naomi Judd, thank you so much. I love Kentucky. I'm one of you. <laughs> For One to One, I'm Bill Goodman.